Okay, everyone, thanks for being here today. Because of some technical issues, we're going to go raw, you know, like acoustic <laughs> when people are on stage and they're just singing a cappella without the orchestra or any music. So I guess this is what we're going to do. However, you can access the slides from GitHub and also the code for the demo from GitHub. So if you have internet connection, then I guess you won't be seeing it up here, but hopefully you can see it on your own mini screen. So yeah, let's get started. So is it the PDF of the slides? Yes. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is the better care and feeding of machine learning models. And before I start, who is a data science practitioner? Or who is aware of the data science workflow? Okay, awesome. So, you know as a data scientist, we have a lot of tools for data cleaning, data visualization, and data modeling. But we're also missing a key component, which is how do we make our analysis more reproducible? How do we make our models more transparent? So that when we hand it off to somebody, they can also understand what we've done. And the key idea behind my presentation today is what are some tips and concrete steps that we can come away with to start engineering for more reproducibility within our machine learning models. And um, the way I like to start is with a personal disaster story just to share with you why we want reproducibility in our machine learning models. So uh, my, one, my one gripe about not having a projector is that I have a lot of really cute cat photos that I don't get to share. So if you're looking at the slides, you can see this is me one year ago working at the computer and I was very green, very enthusiastic, working very hard, but also completely clueless. So I had no readme's in my GitHub. I had no record of what libraries I used, and I didn't even put my code into functions. It was not good. And so you can see that my collaborators were not impressed, because when they looked at my GitHub, they said, what? This is a mess. What are you even trying to do? And not only were my collaborators not impressed, later on, when I tried to recreate my own analysis, future me was also not impressed because what hypotheses had I tested? What experiments had I run before? What were my model's hyperparameters? I had to rerun everything from scratch and that was a lot of upfront work. In fact, what my colleagues did was that they turned my very dirty project into a whole reproducibility workshop on how not to do something and what better steps you can take to improve your project structure. And so, of course, how I felt was like this little cat picture over here. And so then that was definitely a very good lesson into how not to do something. So if you want to know why we want to have more reproducible machine learning workflows, well, high level ethics aside, it's also useful because your collaborators will thank you. Your future self will also thank you. So think of future self. And also you can reduce technical debt. And within my organization right now, because we're managing maybe six or seven projects at the same time. And imagine if six months down the road, we have to re-engineer everything. That is a lot of debt. And so you want to front load everything to be as reproducible and as well laid out as possible. So, what do we actually mean when we talk about reproducibility? And so, again here, I'd like to start with another story. And has anyone here heard of the Boston Housing Dataset? Yes, that's good. And like Catherine John all this morning, who here knows the origin of the Boston Housing Dataset. Why was it created? 
So the story behind the Boston Housing data set was that way back in 1978, two researchers from Harvard University, Daniel and David, asked, how much more would you be willing to pay for a house in an area with cleaner air? And as anyone here in Singapore who has been through the haze knows, being in a polluted environment is not very comfortable. But how much more would you be willing to pay to live in a place that is not smoky and not next to a factory where you can actually be sure that you're breathing healthy air? So what they did was collect all the data that we see in the Boston Housing data set and they plotted a demand curve that you can see here. So when we talk about reproducibility, essentially what we want to do is to be able to take the Boston housing data set, ideally also the code that the researchers use on their analysis, and also documentation on how to run the code. And by just having those three things, we want them to be able to recreate the tables within the paper, and also any figures, and qualitative and, quali qualitative and quantitative results that they came up with. So to summarize, that basically means data, code, and documentation in, then you have your tables, your graphs, and your results out. And that's very easy to wrap your head around, and I really like this example because, I mean, I really like this definition because it was, it came up from researchers in Berkeley and if you look at the slides, there's a link to their Git book, which has many, many examples, so it's a good resource. But what I want to point out is that while this definition is very easy to understand in theory, in practice, it's a lot more different. And so there are actually many levels at which you can implement reproducibility. And maybe this is a good time to use the whiteboard. So at the very least, you can have an organized folders. You know, and then at this point, it's like cleaning your room or folding your clothes. You just need it to be well laid out and well organized. Then at a higher level, you can go, well, I need to have file names that are searchable by my software, then does anyone here use virtual environments or conda environments? Oh, yay. Okay, so then that's the next step. You want to encapsulate your environment. Then you might use Git for version control. And then you can go all the way and start being really fancy by running your models in a container or running MXNet out of only a container so it's an immutable, never going to change environment. And I don't know if anyone's been playing around with this. Analysis and containers. Yeah, cool. Nice. And once you get here, you start to blur the boundaries between data science and DevOps because then you're talking also about microservices and, and all that jazz. But the type, what I want to focus on today is actually at the very beginning where you might think it's a very simple idea to have an organized folder, but it's actually harder than you might think, and also there are very nice Python packages that set us up for success in this area. So within your organized folder, okay, so within your organized folder, remember our definition of reproducibility. We want data, so you have a folder for data, then you have a folder for your code, and then you have, a you have a readme that tells you how to run the code. Then you might have an environment.yaml that allows you to spin up an isolated, standardized environment. And so by using this sort of project template, immediately you can see that we have set our project up to follow a standard reproducible 
workflow. We have our data, we have our code, we have instructions, and we have a way to standardize our environment. And like most things in life, there's a Python package for this. And the Python package was actually created by Audrey Roy, who was a keynote speaker at PyCon, I think, in 2016. So there are very nice templates for Django and for web frameworks. And lately, people have actually been using it to create these standardized project template folders. So you don't actually have to think about reproducibility. It's just done for you. You open up a project. And then before you type any code, you just go cookie cutter, and then your project template, it will lay out all your folders for you. And then even within each folder, you want to keep your sticky fingers off your raw data as much as possible. Never want to touch it. So you have a specific folder for your raw data, and then ideally some scripts as well to download your data. So again, no pointing and clicking. Pointing and clicking is not allowed. Only scripts. And I speak from hard experience. Thanks. <laughs> and you have data that you download with a script, and then you should also have a folder with scripts for processing your data that will ultimately save your data into the process folder here. And then after that, you also have all your data for your models, for your visualization, yada, yada. It's up to you because personally, when I looked at the, of the official cookie cutter data science, it was very constrained. So I pared everything down into a minimalist implementation, so to speak that only has what is absolutely necessary. So what they like to say is that it's opinionated workflow, but it's not constraining. So you follow the principles, but you also try and extend it to what you need. And then you should also have a reports folder. And this reports folder, especially if you're a researcher, or you have to present to stakeholders, then ultimately this will have all your figures, all your graphs. And so all you need to do is to run your code here, and then you can recreate your reports. So remember our definition of reproducibility was data in with code, with documentation, and then results out. So you can see we have our data, we have our code, and then now we're getting our results out here. So. This was supposed to be a demo, but the really dramatic thing, actually, is that th this was supposed to be like a wow moment. So, wow, everybody. Wow. <laughs> what, what you're supposed to be able to do, which is the true test of reproducibility, is actually to delete everything, and then all your models as well, your, your hard trained models that you came up with, you delete all the artifacts, and all of this, and this as well. And then just by running your source code, you will automatically recreate your entire analysis. And this can actually be done because you run your scripts to download your data, then you run your script to process your data, you run your script to create your visualizations, train your models, and then, eh, voila your whole analysis just by running a few scripts. And this is why organized folders, while they are up here in terms of complexity, they are actually a very big and easy win for reproducibility. And so this leads me on. <laughs> OK, so then now what we do in our own work, actually, is that on top of having organized folders, when you start to deal with things like containers, then this is where things get very interesting. So this is really the second part of my talk, where you can use containers, and if you think of each change in data as a diff, you can store the diffs as you iterate through your data, and then ideally you will have 
a way to track the provenance of your data. So if you run your model once, then your data changes, new data comes in, your data also changes, and by tracking those diffs, like you do your code changes, you can also track the provenance. And that is reproducibility on a whole new level, because while I'm sure many of us are very familiar with Git for version control, Git for data, like Catherine mentioned this morning, is a whole different problem that hasn't been cracked yet. However, there are people making stabs at this problem, and if you want, you can check out pachyderm.io. This is not actually a plug for them, so I don't want to like write anything down. It's just one of the options that you might want to look at. And the idea is that by using containers, you can containers and Kubernetes, and uh, I'm angling this right now, but the idea is that by tracking the diffs to your data, then you can track the provenance and where your data has come from. And that is something that's very new and very exciting within the industry. And also, a side benefit of that is that once you have reproducible models, it also opens the door to someone taking that model and then asking you, holding you accountable to explaining it. And so this is where we talk about model interpretability. And to repeat myself, like most things in life, there's a Python package for that. So what is quite exciting was that at NIPS last year, the one best paper for this package called SHAP. And what it allows you to do is to measure the feature importance for every data point in your data set. So again, to use the Boston housing data, you can say, well, this data point was predicted to, this house was predicted to be worth $700,000. Why? And you can see from the graph here that there are certain factors in blue that are pushing the predicted value down. And there are certain factors in red that are pushing the predicted value up. And there are magnitudes associated with each factor. And so now you can imagine if you are touched with denied a credit card loan, very naturally you want to know, well, what were the features in the model that led to this outcome? And by using this library and recreating the analysis, we can have an auditable workflow. And when people's livelihoods are involved, like with credit scoring or medical advice, you can see how this would actually be very useful. And this is another graph where you can stack the entire data set. And what I really like about this is that you can see different factors play different levels of importance for each data point. And you can also plot the interactions between factors. Sometimes it's not a linear effect. And then just to wrap up, on top of all what we've talked about interpretability, and tracking data provenance. If you think about your model as a container, then you can also extend that idea further and say, well, then my model is just a container within an entire microservices architecture. Then can we monitor the performance of that model using DevOps engineering monitoring tools? Can we use continuous integration and continuous deployment with our machine learning models. And right now, within the DevOps community, one very big word is observability. So looking at the behavior of all your microservices as a whole. And then this leads on really to machine learning blending into DevOps. And this is a very exciting blend, in my opinion, and I'm quite interested to see where this will go. But Yes, to recap everything, organize your folders well, name your files well, use version control, and keep an eye out for the latest developments. So thanks.